Hello, it is nice to be back here. Um, I didn't want to be uploading this video next because there's been a lot of Colby on the channel recently. But I had a little bit of bad luck this month. I broke my laptop and I never thought to back up my document files. You know, I have been backing up my, my uh, movie files for, for years because they're so big. But I lost about three or four years of uh, research and scripts. Every document that I had ever written for the channel uh, just went down a drain. Uh, which is a disaster for me. Massive, massive mistake for me. But uh, all the upcoming projects I had, the end of the Khabib Dagestan series, I had, I had done some work on Deontay Wilder. That's all gone down the drain. So uh, I'm just going to upload this video now and start trying to rebuild. And on top of that, it was actually difficult for me to replace the laptop because uh, I'm in lockdown in Colombia and they went into a very aggressive lockdown. And so it was difficult for me to get my hands on a laptop in the end i had to settle for a small macbook air uh which was delivered by the pizza delivery boy anyway you know since the uh the vast vast majority of the subscribers on this channel are in the northern hemisphere uh i might as well talk a little bit about the situation down here in the southern hemisphere because uh, we're all going through this universally if you're totally jaded by this subject if you've just had enough of this coverage uh, just go ahead and skip on a couple of minutes there. Uh, I won't be offended. So every country has to deal with it differently. And I have a friend here who's a doctor in one of the hospitals in Medin. And she studied for a couple of years in Europe, in Spain and Italy. So she was getting first-hand accounts from the situation over there. And she was absolutely terrified about the implications of that type of situation on a country like Colombia. Um, I've been to multiple hospitals here in Colombia. I was sick when I got here first. Uh, one of the things I heard about Colombia is that it has 25 of the 50 best hospitals in South America. I don't know how reliable that article was, but uh, I've been to multiple hospitals here and I've seen both sides of it. The first hospital I went to was unbelievable. I mean, I've never seen anything like it. The waiting room was tiny, the facilities were terrible, they were understaffed and the staff seemed overworked. The waiting room was full to the point that there was people standing around, uh, people who were badly sick. There was one guy bleeding out of a hole in his head. And eventually the doctor came out and he said, hey, the typical waiting time in this hospital is 12 hours. 12 hours. I mean, you wouldn't want to be showing up there with 11 hours to live. That wouldn't be working out for you. The point I'm making there is that for the people who have to use facilities like that, that was the healthcare system under normal circumstances without any exacerbating factors. But then I went to a private hospital and I got unbelievable care. I mean, it was a phenomenal facility, really excellent. And that's probably not a bad metaphor for the haves and the have-nots in the country. And so as a result, they went into an extremely aggressive lockdown. I mean, initially, I couldn't get 50 meters from my house without meeting... I mean, I'm not even talking about police. I'm talking about the army. And these guys were just forming blockades... They were armed to the gills. They looked like they were getting ready to invade Venezuela. Uh, it was actually quite intimidating. But the reality was, you know, I was on their side because they knew they represented the line between relative order and the healthcare system just collapsing into chaos. And so they were quite heavy handed. Uh, you're only allowed out of your house two days a week here. And if they caught you outside your house on the wrong day, they would be promptly sending you back to your apartment. So that was the situation initially. But the country is kind of between a rock and a hard place because, you know, you hear people say the cure is worse than a disease. And I know there's people, especially business owners and small business owners who are really struggling. But in the Northern Hemisphere, where the countries are wealthy enough to kind of get by for a couple months, I don't think that's the situation yet. Uh, who knows, you know, if it goes on for six months to a year, that might be a consideration. But in poor countries in the Southern Hemisphere like this, where they have millions and millions of poor people uh, who largely depend on pedestrians, you know, they might be begging, uh, they might be wiping windshields. Uh, some of them have kiosks where they sell fruit. You know, these people, they're not living month to month. They're living week to week, uh, or even in some cases, day to day. The idea that the cure is worse than the disease is a much bigger consideration for a country like this. And so initially the police who had been going out and basically sweeping these people uh, off the streets, after a couple weeks they were going out and handing out food and taking photos to kind of put out the idea that the government were doing something to ease the hardship. Uh, because otherwise, you know, they're going to be dealing with riots. 
Um, I'm surprised how civilized the country has been when you consider the number of poor people. I mean, I haven't noticed any uptick in crime, but uh, they are between a rock and a hard place, so it's difficult to kind of predict how it will play out the longer it goes on. I recently saw a clip from Bill Gates, who uh, I know is kind of a controversial figure to be quoting at this time, but um, he was explaining that optimistically he could see the situation starting to clear up over the next couple months in the Northern Hemisphere if there's a seasonality associated with it. But that if that is the case, then the countries in the Southern Hemisphere will get absolutely decimated. And if that's the case, I think you'll have situations that will make Italy and Spain pale in comparison. Because as good as some of the hospitals are here, largely the facilities that most of the population would have to be visiting are just not equipped to handle this. So uh, we'll see how it all plays out. Anyway, that's all I got as your uh, Colombian correspondent. Uh, with regards to the channel, as I said, I lost a ton of work recently, so I'll have to try to get the ball rolling again in May. Uh, one of the things I'm considering doing is re-uploading a couple of videos. Uh, I normally don't like that idea. Uh, I've always intended on re-uploading the first part of the Dagestan series because it's a critical part of that series. But towards the end of the month, I might re-upload that old Tony Ferguson video too. Some people were looking for that, and I'd like to get some momentum going in the channel again anyway, so there's no time like the present. Beyond that, uh, I hope everyone is doing well. I uh, hope you're not struggling to maintain your sanity. I hope you haven't become a reckless, hopeless alcoholic, dwindling your time away drinking beers and smoking cigarettes, as is quite tempting to do. Uh, yeah, hope everyone is doing well. The ATT fallout and Dana White beef at the forefront of Colby Covington's public affairs, it was almost possible to forget the minor matter of his volatile relationship with his opponent Kamaru. I had envisioned it being an interesting ideological clash that largely mirrored the bitter political divide currently gripping America, and to an extent it did represent that. They both spoke about the true nature of being American, with Usman almost embodying the left's notion of the good-natured, hard-working immigrant simply looking for a better life. And I need to let him know that I am more American than he is. First and foremost, I'm an immigrant who came here, worked his tail off to get to where I am. I did everything right. I didn't cheat anybody. I didn't lie. I didn't do you know, any of the, the things that they're trying to say immigrants do. Mm -hmm. I didn't do any of that. I paid my dues and I got what he wanted. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm sitting up here and he's down here looking up at me. So I need to remind him that I am more American than he is. I'm the one living the American dream. Colby responded to Usman's claim with an absolutely devastating line that reflected a more conservative concern, namely crime. So, you know, he's saying he's more American than me. What's more American than him than me? My family served for this country in the, in the Korean War, in the Vietnam War. What's his family ever served besides in the penitentiary? This back and forth was hilarious, and it was resonant in the current climate, but the buildup could hardly be said to fully embody that divide in a remotely profound manner. The insults from Colby were largely sophomoric in nature. The only reason he's relevant is because he attaches his name to mine. December 14th, only on pay-per-view, I'm detaching this little clown from my coattails. There's a reason why I'm not fighting this weekend. You might want to ask this guy. He couldn't, he pissed hot, he, you know, he, he couldn't, he couldn't pass a piss test. People would rather, rather watch flies fuck than watch you fight. Those similarities end it. you know, he's taking my sloppy seconds. I beat everybody he beat, but I beat him before he beat him. So he had to come pick up the carcasses off the dead bodies that I left. So, you know, he's not impressive. He sucks at fighting and December 14th, I'm gonna expose him. Are you guys wow. talking about Marty's hair? He's got 30% of his hairline left. Isn't that disgusting? Let's talk about that lazy eye. Let's switch it up. Let's switch it up. Let's switch it up. Put that lazy eye back to work. I mean, Kobe's mocking his fucking hairline. This is kindergarten level insults. He may as well say, hey, Usman stinks like shit. He did have a couple good insults. You know, Chael put the following in his list of top lines for the year. Number four, Colby Covington on stage at Madison Square Garden opposite Kamaru Usman. Tells Kamaru, 
You couldn't draw money if they handed you a sheet of white paper and a green crayon. Now, you couldn't draw money with a green crayon and a white piece of paper. Which is good, but my favorite was his humorous paraphrasing of the 1946 movie, It's a Wonderful Life. Come on, bro. Don't talk, man. No one wants to hear you talk. Every time you talk, you just a pay-per-view goes Shut out. Shut up. Uh, that's a good one. That is a good one. And if there was any doubt about the effect of Colby's insults, there was one line that certainly found a home, albeit not the intended one. Colby had previously made the statement that Usman was ducking Colby so hard, he gave Glenn Robinson a heart attack, which I have to admit, even though it's an extremely poor taste, it's funny because it's just how stupid it is. Colby now added insult to injury at the press conference. I know you gave Glenn a heart attack for all those years you were, you were ducking me, so don't worry, he'll be watching from hell on December 14th. He'll be watching from hell. I mean, Jesus Christ. He's dancing on Glenn's grave at this point. As we know, Glenn Robinson died just over a year ago, and these repeated taunts did eventually elicit an appeal from Glenn's daughters, who asked Colby to refrain from using their father's death as a punchline. I mean, Jesus Christ. I'm not going to read it all, but here's the gist. The death of our father is still very raw. Our family is still grieving from his loss. So imagine the hurt we felt to hear such hateful words recklessly said about our father. I actually just realized that I've been spelling reckless with a W for years. I thought it was a derivative of the word wreck. Anyone else stunned by that revelation? Anyway, we understand the excitement of building up hype before a fight, but we are sure Colby Covington can get press for his upcoming fight in his own merit and without spewing hateful words towards our father, the founder of Black Zillions. They then go on to eulogize Glenn as a good-natured, kind-hearted man who tragically died too young. So here we have a heartfelt appeal from a grieving family. And how does Colby respond? Well, on the offensive, of course. But he had to file bankruptcy many times on his companies and he didn't pay Marty Fake Newsman after he won the Ultimate Fighter when the UFC paid him like 250 grand. People don't know that story. They need to check more into that. He's not that good of a person. Glenn Robinson, he was one of the media. He was always looking to become famous, so he should be happy that I made him famous, you know. Look I'm sure Glenn always dreamed of becoming famous as a punchline in the repertoire of a cocky prick like Colby Covington. You know, my favorite definition on the website Urban Dictionary has always been the one for ass clown. It's just perfect. Ass clown. One who, through the fault of his parents' conception, is a skid mark in society's collective underwear. Whoever put that definition together is a poet. It's just a beautiful combination of words. So here we have a case where Colby is firing shots and there's no confusion about whether they found their mark. The grieving family of the deceased asked Colby to refrain. That's a pretty serious request. You know, we saw a similar but much more publicized case of this exact phenomena with Ari Shafir recently uh, when he ended his career dancing on Kobe Bryant's grave. And you know, whether or not you agree with people using other people's death as a source of humor and self-promotion, I think the vast majority of people are going to feel some sense of remorse reading a request like that from Glenn's family. You know, it becomes very real and personal at that point. But Colby really showed what a cold-blooded scoundrel he can be when he needlessly doubled down on dancing on a man's grave despite such an appeal. At that point, I think you're being a fucking ass clown, a skid mark on society's collective underwear. But while Usman felt the animosity, he denied it would affect his performance in the cage, outside fueling some especially grievous bodily harm. If I can't help but notice that Colby is not around, is that because they can't put you guys in the same room? Is there any truth to that? You leave two, two uh, you know, you leave a, a chihuahua in the room with a lion, at some point something's gonna happen, and so. What impact do you think that'll have on your performance? None. Well, I think it, it, it will a little bit in the fact of, you know, things are gonna be a little harder. For me, as as far as when I when I deliver that that punch, it's gonna feel a little harder. You know, when I deliver that kick, it's gonna feel a little harder. When I take you down and I'm, I'm squeezing the life out of him and I'm starting to kind of land shots, they're gonna be a little harder. He's gonna feel the animosity and the intensity behind those strikes. It's not gonna be strikes to set something up. It's gonna be strikes to put you in the hospital. And me coming out victorious is always the key. It's always the goal, you know. But um, yeah, of course, uh, you know, I want to do a little extra damage in this fight, so. We'll see how it goes. And so it had all led to this. 
Kobe spoke several times about changing out of necessity. And as I've said before, I think the most charitable take on a persona was a man who wanted to be champion, was prepared to do whatever it took to make that happen, and subsequently got lost in his own gimmick. The whole thing had always been inexorably leading to this point, a shot at the undisputed welterweight title of the world. And as we now reach the biggest fight of Colby Covington's life, he was clearly in the most precarious position of his entire career. He was training on scorched earth. He appeared to be on thin fucking ice with the company. And he was about to get locked in a cage with a man who seemed both single-minded in his intent to decapitate Colby while stating those intentions with relative calm and composure. If he could capitalize, the show would go on. But if he faltered, the looming backlash promised to be unfucking forgiving For two years, he had angered and offended thousands of fans. Every time a microphone presented itself, he danced on a man's grave. If he failed on the grandest stage, he would soon find out exactly how it feels to have people dancing on your grave. A win and the show goes on, a loss and it is a long way down to a rough fucking landing. The stakes were nothing short of enormous for Colby Covington. Heading into the fight, the two men had almost identical records, and both had just shocked the world with flawless, dominating performances against Woodley and Lawler. Both possessed relentless gas tanks, improving stand-up and suffocating styles that gradually, or often very quickly, drained the life out of their opponents. It didn't on paper promise to be a super exciting fight, but it was an extremely compelling one. During a face-off, they both looked ready to go salivating at the prospect of distancing themselves from the welterweight pack by smashing the fuck out of a bitter rival. And they proceeded to getting after it right away. Usman open with kicks, Colby pushing the pressure, mixing it up with kicks and uppercuts. The two men meet in the middle and start trading. Coming in, they were both known for pushing the pace and being the aggressor. And you absolutely got the sense that neither guy wanted to take a step back. Colby was getting after it, taking it to the champ. He stepped it up in a major manner, trying to press the advantage. The two men were trading at the bell. As Mark Goddard stepped in, Colby looked over his shoulder as if to say, Hey, I got you, motherfucker. In the second, they got right back to trading big shots. Neither guy wanted to take a step back. This looked like a pure battle of wills here. Very even round at the midpoint. In the final minute, Colby lands big and seems to stun Kamaru, while Usman lands a wicked body shot that hurts Colby. The round ends with the two men staring each other down. It's almost as if neither guy wants to relent, even between rounds. At the beginning of the third, the fight appeared to have slowed somewhat. Usman begins working the body, and he gradually begins taking control, eventually backing a fading Colby up. Usman looks the fresher, more composed fighter in this round. He has Colby on the back foot. Punctuating an already dominant round, in the final seconds, he lands a catastrophic shot. And this time as the round ends, there's no stare down. There was a clear shift of momentum here. And in the corner, Colby admits he's been badly injured. On the buzzer, Usman had broken his jaw. In the fourth round, they get right into a firefight. With a broken jaw, Colby is showing some savage instincts. He was again pushing the pace. Colby's throwing a lot, he's missing a lot. But he is again pushing that pace. Kamaru continues working the body. Amazing round. Colby's not finished yet. They once again finish staring each other down. Tough round to call, but Colby has rebounded and did so with a broken jaw. We now know they were heading into the final round even on the scorecards. It would all be decided in the last five minutes, and Colby seemed to be getting the better of it early on. He clearly caught a second wind in the championship rounds. But with two on the clock, Usman lands a devastating right hand that snaps Colby's head back, sending him into the fence. There's blood in the water, and Usman tries to press the advantage, throwing some huge shots. Colby tries to circle in survival mode, but a huge right hand lands and finally plants a battle worn Colby on his ass. Covington is right back to his feet, with Kamaru swarming him. Another right puts Colby down for a second time, with Kamaru mashing his ass up. Colby clearly hurt, the ref steps in and waves the fight. The 
the obvious poetic justice of Colby's mouth being closed in a brutal and emphatic fashion of a broken jaw wasn't lost on anyone. In the aftermath, it was interesting to see where everyone landed on the whole Colby fiasco. Obviously, the performance itself was gutsy, but displaying the heart of a champion would never be enough to save him from the inevitable backlash. Jorge danced in his grave with the harsh tweet, They say never kick a man when he's down, but you not a man. And he doubled down on the Jim Rome show, saying Colby got exactly what he deserved. So you and Colby Covington were friends. He had the same coach for a long time. But after he beat RDA, he did not pay your coach. What did you make of that at that time? My initial thing was just to break his face in, but my coach said that's uh, that's going to probably get you in jail and you're not going to be able to fight him, blah, blah, blah. Let's let the universe take care of him. And his exact words were, we'll get him in a prize ring and break his jaw. Somebody beat me to that, but his jaw is broken. You know, I don't I don't like to always be highly critical of, of human beings because I'm one and I'm nowhere near perfect. But I'm just not with that whole, your whole career is based out of getting a rise out of people, right? Like if I come on your show and I'm just saying a bunch of controversial stuff for people to be talking about me, like, man, you get reactions out of people. It's not really my style of tea, my cup of tea, but, you know, people do it all the time. And he's the number one poster boy for that, right? So he wants to always get a reaction out of people. Now this individual, when people are trying to get a reaction out of him, he's reporting people on Instagram. He took the comments off so you can't comment on him. And then he was reporting people on Instagram, they were commenting on him. He was saying how negative they were towards him and stuff. This is the guy that, that's calling people virgins, calling people nerds, that they live at their parents' basements, Mars, snowflakes, making fun of Brazilians. You know, that, that, that country, is, it's not like it's a rich country and it's doing well. They got a lot of poverty over there. And he does that all for a like on Facebook, for a paycheck to go, what, the three, four, five pay-per-views that it went up with, you know? The guy's a clown, man. He got what he deserved. He also alluded to ongoing frictions in the gym. The Kobe saga continues. The man had made his bed, and it didn't simply end now that his title run was over. No, but for real, the dude they got his jaw broken. No, man. Wait, listen, D, I was not, and D's gonna get upset that I'm fucked by D, I mean DP. But D's gonna get upset that I'm even saying this because this was like locker room talk. He's like, yo, man, where's fuck Kobe? I go, bro, you know, don't even worry about it because he's on witness protection program. When you see this dude, you can't even touch him if you want. Like, I'm telling you, I'm gonna fuck his ass up, man. I'm tired of this shit. And I go, D, listen, he's got like, I don't know if Trump has hired him or something, but he has like secret service with him, you know? So it's nuts. You can't even look at the guy's direction. He's got too many people on his side. So DP was, was the thing that you could get, you know, get to, get to at least talk to man to man. But now nah, that dude don't go to the gym, man. You know what I'm saying? He's a he's a punk and uh, he got what he deserved. Dana White appeared not to hold any grudge over Colby's 2019 tirade against the company and was looking forward to his next fight. This was possibly a sign of a tempering with time. You know, Dana has definitely mellowed over the years. Or it was possibly an implicit recognition that Colby may be difficult, but the juice is worth the squeeze. And Dana is more than happy to be in the Colby Covington business. He's a jackass, but he's a tough guy. He's tough, he's durable, and uh, he's, he's got a hell of a chin. And, uh, you know, beating him means something. Is he a guy you want to continue to have in the UFC? Yeah, I don't have a problem with him. I don't have a problem with Covington. So, you know, I'd love to do him and Woodley next. That would be a fun fight. But if he has a broken jaw, he ain't going to be around for a minute. So, listen, I've dealt with his type a million times in the last 20 years. You can tell that he is not happy that tonight did not go as he planned. Um, he came out with a game plan and, you know, his whole little, you know, whatever the hell he had going on in his mind that he was going to do or whatever's going to happen in uh, Usman. Uh, stomped all over that so we'll let this kid go back heal up <clears throat> and uh, figure out what's next Kamaru relished the victory and took the opportunity to frame it as a triumph of love and unity over hate and divisiveness he seemed grateful to be the righteous agent of justice for everyone Colby had offended yeah there was a lot there was a lot emotionally uh, a lot that he said um, this one like, and I meant it this one's for the world this one's for the people of Brazil this one is for my former manager this one is for my family this one's for my man and my recent manager this one is for everybody and um, you know when you push hate and you push separation you know love and unity does win sometimes and tonight it won but ultimately he just seemed happy that Colby Covington's circus was leaving town for a while. It was good to just, it, it's good to move past all of that. I'm going to be honest, uh, this was what kept me sane all six, seven months whenever this fight, I knew this fight was going to happen. This is what kept me sane is this moment right here after the fight. That's what I look forward to. This is the addictive moment. This is what keeps me doing this. And what about Colby? Well, his mouth may have been closed, but his thumbs still worked. And the show must go on. 
After the fight, he tweeted his disdain for Mark Goddard, but this was likely primarily to assure the MMA world that his brash, bratty attitude would not be changing. He was beaten, but by no means humbled. We could expect the same brash asshole moving forward. A couple months later on the Helwani Hour, that's exactly what we got, when one by one, he took aim at all the same targets all over again. He's all hype, all hype. He has, what, 14 fucking losses on his record? He's a journeyman 50-50 fighter. What's his record in the last 10 fights? Five and five? Street Judas, journeyman George Masvidal, he hit lightning in a bottle, Ariel, and he knows he needs to capitalize off that lightning in a bottle. That guy deserves a title shot? That's not what the people want. The people want me, Ariel, and I'm the people's champion for a reason. Mark not so good or robbed the people of a fair fight. He robbed the fight of a fight down the middle, and you know, this needs to be ran back, Ariel. And if it before, I didn't, I didn't pay attention to anything Dana says. And, no one cares about Marty because they see through his act. They see how fake he is. Uh, literally, a mop has more charisma than Marty Fake Newsman. If I was Marty Fake Newsman, I would not accept a win like that, Ariel. He was also now denying his jaw was even broken, a claim undermined by this photo of a clearly broken jaw and the details of his medical suspension. So make of that what you will. How is it? I don't remember Ariel ever going on the mic and saying, hey guys, I got a broken jaw. No, I didn't break my jaw in my fight. Does, does my, does my jaw look broken? I've been smiling. I've been with all my mama sitas, you know? And so I think one chapter of the Colby Covington story ends. And it ended with a bang. Colby delivered in a big way. But he lost. In the aftermath, predictably, he was served generous helpings of humble pie on social media. You know, I saw guys like Shaw and Ariel defending him and appealing for some mercy with regards to backlash. But this guy was never out to cultivate a fan base. He was a provocateur, primarily concerned with cultivating hate. The vitriol with which his loss was met was not only fair, but it was actually a testament to his success. And it's what made the whole thing interesting. The idea that in any fight it could all come crashing down. With each win, the inevitable downfall became all the more intriguing. Would he finally be made pay for his words? Colby always fought with his back against the wall. And even though on this occasion he failed, he never failed to perform, this time under the brightest lights and unimaginable pressure. The guy fought his fucking ass off. In his campaign, Colby showed the utility of a microphone, the power of simply not giving a single solitary shit, and most importantly in his loss, he showed that he is only a nose behind the very best welterweight in the world. And so whether you're a fan or you despise a guy, one thing is for sure, at the highest level of the sport, we have not seen the last of Colby Covington. The show, or the fiasco, or the farce, whatever you want to call it, it is going nowhere. Depending on how you look at it, it seems we're either destined or doomed to relive the whole fucking thing. And personally, I'm looking forward to it. So I got to run through all the comments from uh, the last three Colby videos. So would you share some of the topics you have in mind for your videos in 2020? <laughs> oh, God, what a uh, what a what an inter well, under the circumstances now. I mean, what an interesting uh, question, because um, I don't think there's going to be a lot of current content coming up. But, you know, the nature of my channel is can go back and do things that are in interesting from the past. Um, one video I always would have liked to do would be the period from uh, Chael Sonnen's arrival in the UFC to, you know, the end of the Anderson uh, rivalry. I think you could definitely get a good 20 minutes out of something like that. Um, and as I said, I want to uh, look at the Tyson Fury video and uh, I had something planned on Deontay Wilder. But yeah, I think I'll get an opportunity to look back uh, a little bit further and do content on fighters that I wouldn't have had an opportunity to cover under normal circumstances. But uh, <laughs> that's a funny question now.
So Matthew Vosper says, here is what I think. The UFC is a multi-billion dollar company. It revolves around money. I think this horse shit is either fully scripted uh, quite deliberately to hype for money gain, pay-per-views, etc. Yeah, I could definitely see that. I mean, I could definitely see that. Some of the con comments from uh, Mass Vidal uh, were quite scathing. And I think he's less a bullshitter than Colby, so I did kind of buy into it. But um, I don't necessarily disagree with that opinion. I think that's definite possibility. Uh, Shawnee C, can't believe you kind of made me like Colby a bit too. Yeah, I mean, for me, Colby is like, um, I like some things and I appreciate the hustle. And there's definitely been moments in there that I really dislike. I, I definitely do not hate the guy. I would consider myself somewhat of a fan. Romantic Grizzly Bear. I mean, that's, uh, that's an interesting name you got there. I think a lot of fans think everything is black and white and everything is scripted. The UFC wants a big fight. Jorge and Colby are faking it, blah, blah, blah. Honestly, does Jorge Masvidal strike you like the type of guy that plays 3D chess with the MMA community by getting his entire gym in on the storyline to fight an unsuccessful contender? That's Masvidal is the more convincing of the two for me. I agree with that. Instead of partaking in the unspoken agreement to promote and going along with Askin's promotion philosophy by creating fake drama, he followed his own way and found success. Saying he planned this all for a fight is like saying Khabib is doing it for the money and Derek Lewis for the passion of it all. Covington, <laughs> uh, Covington has shown time and time again that nothing is too far for him. After calling out all of Brazil and its people, the things he called them and Khabib a sheep fucker, throwing an old friend under the bus seems like child's play. Real things do happen. Friends get on bad terms, bad blood forms, people kick each other when they're down and bite each other's heels as they climb up. As I said, I'm undecided on the whole thing, but I would be leaning towards, based on uh, Masvidal being involved and the whole gym being involved, I think it's probably, uh, probably real. Oswell St. Oswald. I've always appreciated a good heel, even though I'm more of an anti-hero or babyface lover. But Colby at one point bugged me to the point where I almost wanted to forego watching a card just to send a message that he doesn't fly with me. But your trash video coupled with the Lawler whooping and the potential mass for Dal meeting made me buy into the storyline. So thank you for that. Well, no problem. Glad I could uh, change your opinion somewhat. Our interest, I mean. Because I want to enjoy all that MMA has to offer, except maybe Ryan Bader as the double champ. <laughs> yeah, I like Chael a lot and even enjoy Trump as far as entertaining heels go. Uh, but geez, what a cringy performance by Colby. Yeah, I have to say, I, th I think Trump is like a, is like a comedian um, with some of the stuff he comes up with. I'm not going to get into politics, but the guy just says some outrageous stuff and... Uh, that 2016 uh, presidential campaign, he could have released a comedy special from the material in that. It was hilarious. But uh, as I said, I won't get into the politics of the guy because uh, it's incredibly divisive. All the power to him to make a buck rather than slip into oblivion. But the drama at ATT and the Dana hate has some real life uh, meat skull vibes. I mean, Chael may be a bona fide sociopath as far as we know, but there's a spark of intelligence there that makes him likable. Other than Vandalay, everyone seemed to understand Chael. Whereas even in the tales from the grind, Colby comes off as like a meat skull lackey. It's easy for me to type shit like this, and I and I do want to give him credit, because meat skull with no charisma or not. <laughs> it takes epic balls and work ethic to do what he's done. Last, I know Dana lies a lot, and I think fighters should be paid their worth, but the man has built this sport, and I always look at it like the money these fighters ain't getting is going to a whole lot more fighters globally getting a chance to fight for even a measly 10 g come to think of it a dana video could be a good video yeah i would consider doing a dana video you know normally when i bring dana up in uh, videos i'm criticizing the guy and the reason for that is because it's usually him uh, in some dispute with the fighters but you know i have mixed feelings about dana as well i think he's He's got his good and his bad, and he certainly has built the sport. I mean, he's done a hell of a lot for the sport. Maybe I'm naive, but Dana has always felt as real as real could be in that position. Yeah, I agree with that. All that said and done, I wanted Colby to beat Usman just to see where all this was going. Thanks for the videos. No problem. Matthew Vosper. Doesn't surprise me. I think there is truth indeed to what Colby is complaining about. Pretty damn sweet of him to talk that much shit about Dana in the UFC. I like the reported assessment. Hey, Dana, you piece of shit. Yeah, it's funny. Jesse Merle, 
who also has a very good YouTube channel, actually. You should check it out. Paying Colby a traditional challenges offer is absurd, like Nate Diaz, until you blow the doors off. Sometimes only you can see what you're worth until that's what you are. After the Usman fight, they better pay this fucking guy. Colby strikes me as a guy who knows his worth and will go out of his way to get it. He's shown he'll go head to head with the UFC and I think they will be paying that guy in future. Never ending saga. Uh, Colby's plight is an interesting one. From not being noticed to creating a brash, outspoken character, almost out of self-preservation. He had genius moments of promotion at times, other it was like he allowed the character into his personal life. I heard Colby planned on basically letting the act go if he won the title. Playing the heel seemed to have worn on him. I thought he showed it in interviews close to the fight. Yeah, he did. He did, uh, he did dial it back. Nicholas Teoro. Although Colby is a complete asshole, realistically he hasn't done anything near as bad as Connor or John. So I think that bouncing back from this loss isn't too crazy. Hopefully the broken jaw won't have any lasting effects on his chin. I think welterweight is so much more interesting with him around. I agree, Connor and John have certainly done far worse. They don't tend to draw as much ire, but I mean, the other side of it is that Colby's actions, which are just words at the end of the day, um, they're just, they're designed solely to rile people up. He's trying with every fiber of his being to get under your skin. Jesse Merle, uh, watch the interview clip of Jorge on Ariel's show again. Consider that everyone agrees Colby's thing is an act and him, Dustin, and Masvidal were all best friends. You're an expert in reading people just like me. Well, thank you very much. Uh, watch that clip again. Colby and Dustin are in the room with him. That interview is when I knew the Colby beef is fake. He's in the room with Jorge and so is Dustin. Uh, okay, let's take a look at that. Actually, this is pretty interesting. When the interview starts, Masvidal looks up as someone enters the room and he kind of jumps up and reorientates the camera so you can't see who's in the room. Uh, wait up, I'm switching. I'm being told to switch <laughs> position. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're upgrading to like a bigger screen or something. And throughout the interview, he's making these kind of cheeky glances up and he's got a really cheeky kind of look on his face. I think he might be on to something. And there's a point as well where uh, the other person in the room speaks and Jorge just breaks down laughing, but he won't say who's in the room. But I'm the one calling the fucking shots. <laughs> I can't tell him all Come on, what is this? What was that? And then whoever that person is continues to speak throughout the interview, and Jorge just kind of waves him off. Okay. <laughs> you know? Uh, uh, Jorge, are you attending UFC 246? So, it is suspicious. I think that could be a good catch there. That was cheeky. If that is true, that was fucking cheeky. Solid us. Uh, Kobe's story has so much similarities with Chael Sonnen's title run. Both talk shitload of bullshit to lift their careers up to the next level. They put themselves in a position where they stand against the wall. For both men, losing wasn't an option or an outcome to think of. And the biggest moment they gave 110%. And so it came down to the fifth round. One round away from the absolute glory. Their dreams got crushed. What a story. Only Dostu Dostojewski. Dosko Dostojewski. <laughs> that is a funny typo, my man. Dostojewski. Yeah, there's massive similarities between the two. Actually, now that you mention it coming down to the fifth. Um, yeah, that is true. I think uh, Colby certainly took some uh, elements out of Chael's playbook. Jethro Gaia. If what they say about Colby censoring the comments section of his social media and reporting people, then all his bravado regarding our society being snowflakes proves true. And the finger points back at him as he shows his true colors. Yeah, that's true. That is true. You can't be calling people uh, snowflakes and uh, going out of your, trying to get people blocked. I mean, Jesus Christ. If you really want to support Colby, don't defend him or go easy, as Ariel suggests as this is the opposite of the atmosphere he's created. The rage against him is his jet fuel. Conversely, if you hate Colby, you should promote feeling sorry for him and endorse compassion, as this is the biggest protest of his ass clownery, as it avoids fighting fire with fire and ultimately, ultimately puts a wet blanket on the hate circus he pushes. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I mean, getting irate about Colby's crap is certainly playing in the guy's hands. Seb Sebastian, just wondering, could we get an idea on the next videos we'll drop? Well, as I said, I want to be more active in May because uh, catastrophic uh, April for me and uh, I need to get the ball rolling. Matthew Vosper, broken jaw is poetic. Yeah, I mean, it is hilarious. <laughs> Alexander Pulido, 
Are you considering to do a video of Tyson Fury? I know I already have one from his resurrection, but one from his latest fight with Wilder would be awesome. Yeah, I will do a Tyson... Actually, I've got a ton of uh, people looking for a Tyson Fury video, and I was putting it off a little bit. Um, it's a difficult one because there were such great themes running through the uh, previous two videos I did on Fury, um, from his downfall to his resurrection. But I saw some of the coverage leading into his last fights, and I they were trying to touch those same themes. And they were a little hollow. I felt that they were using it purely promotionally and that the moment had passed. So, I mean, that's a part of his story and where he is now is a result of that. But I feel like this last fight, those rich themes, they're not there in the same way. So I'll have to take a long look at it and see what, uh, what I can come up with. Um, but yeah, I'll certainly be covering that fight, definitely. Charles Northrup, been a big fan for a while. Can't wait for the next Fury video. Uh, recently re-watched your latest two videos on him for the first Wilder fight. Quick question, do you think there's a deeper meaning behind Fury's choice of singing American Pie after the two Wilder fights? Oh man, I do not have an opinion on that. Uh, I assume the song has some type of sentimentality for him. And he might have just been thinking, you know, the first one wasn't right. Um, and he wanted to sing the same song after winning, after righting the wrong. It is a great song to sing, actually. It's a great song. Anyway, uh, so that's it. That's uh, We got Drew Allen coming here with 3-1 Colby. Mark not so good at... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's it. That's, uh, that's all the comments there. So thank you very much.